to help them to become somewhat open minded and be willing to accept the possibilities but how are we going to do that well the quickest way to do that is to get them to identify themselves with us so therefore we're going to reveal ourselves in great detail so that they can see what we went through and how that affected us and then they can see how we recovered and so we're going to do enough of this that somewhere in this book every newcomer is going to find themselves so we start out with Bill's story which is every man's story it's every alcoholic story it's a universal alcoholic story and that's where the identification process will start and then as we go along we've got the story of Jim and the story of Fred that we find in chapter 3 and the allegory of the jaywalker which by the way is very very pointed and when you're working with your sponsees you ask them to read those three paragraphs carefully because they can they can see themselves in this guy who couldn't stop jaywalking he kept getting hit and injured and lost his job and lost his wife and kept on swearing off jaywalking couldn't stop and finally he got hit by a fire engine or something and it broke his back and that was the end of him but you could follow his odyssey through the days when he could jaywalk with impunity you could just imagine this guy standing out there in the middle of the avenue of america's playing playing toreador with the taxi cab you know, psh, psh. and he got away with it for years and then all of a sudden he lost a little bit of his edge maybe a little of his peripheral vision he wasn't quite as quick as he was before and they, he started getting winged and he started getting crushed and eventually he got nailed and all along the way he wanted to quit jaywalking but he didn't know how he couldn't even though he lost everything and he knew what was going to happen if he didn't get out of the street he was going to be killed and he couldn't we have the story of Roland Hazard it's, he's not identified but it's a very important story because it is where one of the keystones of AA and it, uh, it demonstrates one of the most important points that we find in the early chapters of the big book namely that self-knowledge will not keep us sober and thereby hangs a major tail because the human solutionists would insist that if we just know enough about ourselves and why we drink and all those triggers and those wellsprings and if we can just straighten out our, our emotions and our feelings and so forth we won't drink anymore and balderdash doesn't work and hell if that was all it took we wouldn't need AA and we saw the story of Roland Hazard who was with Dr. Young for a year in Switzerland being psychoanalyzed he knew everything about himself when he came back to the United States he knew he'd never drink again he knew so much about himself and about why he drank it was, it was quite clear he'd never drink again and within a month or so he was drunk finally Dr. Young had to tell him I can't help you you're one of those chronic alcoholics and nobody can help you the only thing that's going to help you is to have a complete spiritual awakening a spiritual experience a complete psychic change he told him and, and, and Young was right I mean he threw up his hands and so did Silkworth Silkworth knew he couldn't he couldn't help the chronic he knew it so we've got these stories and they are very helpful and there are a couple of other allusions as we go through the first 11 chapters to real people and what happened to them but you see when they got to the end of that they said but we're going to have to make sure that the alcoholic who reads this book is going to be able to identify themselves with somebody a real person in order to help them to overcome their denial and so they decided to add a bunch of personal stories in the back of the book now if we look at from that standpoint we can see how critically important those stories are for somebody new that's they were written for the newcomer they were written for the newcomer to be able to identify themselves with real alcoholics who reveal themselves and all of their travails with alcoholism and then show how they recovered well now that's the other side of the of the coin the big book is designed to help the newcomer overcome and break down the walls of denial 
and on the other hand to bring them hope because remember we're dealing with a hopeless seemingly hopeless state of mind and body here and so all the way through the big book we have one chapter after another which concentrates on positive statements promises that if you do this this will happen just think what the 12 step says maybe the greatest promise of all that if you work these 12 steps you will have a spiritual awakening tonight when we when we read chapter 5 I don't know did we read chapter 5 I, maybe I wasn't paying attention how it, works, yes. huh? how it works yeah the three pertinent ideas there's a great promise we just run right by it sometimes maybe we're not thinking what it's saying that we're alcoholic can't manage your own lives no human power is going to take away our alcoholism in other words no human power is going to relieve us of the obsession compulsion to drink which is what keeps us going which that's the insanity but the God can and will if we seek him that's a tremendous promise God will relieve us of the obsession and compulsion to drink alcohol if we seek him and then you ask yourself well okay how do I seek God well it's right there you work the steps well, you know that how do you know that because 12 step says that as a result of working these steps you're going to have a spiritual awakening and right there in, in the in the tenth between the 10th 11 steps it tell us tells us we will be restored to sanity we will enter the world of the spirit we will become god conscious and we'll develop a vital sixth sense which means that we have developed an actual connection with god you see so it's all right there and and this these promises if they're read and understood by a new person or explained to them by their sponsor which is a wonderful thing to do bring great hope you can say well maybe this will work for me too the person who is not going to be willing to do the work is quite often is a person who can't see any possibility of recovery they're without hope and the sponsor's job is to bring them hope if I get somebody new what I say to them is I look him right in the eye and I say, now look, here's the way it is. I'm going to show you what to do. And I want your commitment that you'll do it. And that you won't drag your feet or delay. And you'll just follow the directions I give you. And I promise you I'll show you every step of the way, exactly where that is in the book and why, why we do it. Now, if you promise me to do that, and if you do it, I promise you that you'll be just fine because I know that that's a fact I don't have any power here to get anybody sober but I know how to teach the steps because I've been doing it for a while and I know where the power lies the power lies in the steps and if I'm going to help somebody I can't help them by having them call me every day or I'll fire them or hang around for a year going to meetings just not drinking I might just well take them right out here on 441 and wait for the next bus to come along toss them in front of it so I'm going to I'm going to promise them I'll teach them how to work the steps and they got to promise me that they're going to do the work and then when I tell them you're going to be just fine if you do that and they know I mean it that maybe helps a little bit in breaking loose from the sense of hopelessness I, I believe it does a lot of us uh, a lot of our responsibility as sponsors you know is is to be living what we believe not just talking about it we always have to keep in mind what we what we prayed for remember in the third step prayer we ask God to take away our difficulties so that the victory he gives us over those will allow us to be helpful to other people to be an example of God's power, his love, and his way of life working in and through us so that we can be helpful to them by example. And when we do that, we have great influence on them because they see us and they see us working. Yes? Jim, what happens when you have a sponsee that is going to do it um, his way? He's undisciplined, you know. He's got no, no discipline, and he doesn't take suggestions comes to meetings late, leaves early, that sort of thing. Doesn't, you, you make some suggestions, he doesn't want to follow the suggestions. 
I mean, there's a lot of people that come into these rooms that are very defiant and very... Oh, yeah. One of the things that we can do to ameliorate that situation right from the beginning is, first of all, I tell a new person, read the book, which is what the book tells me to do. And that will eliminate most of the tire kickers. The people who just need to have somebody they can call or sponsor because they have to satisfy somebody down at the treatment center or their probation officer or somebody who's looking over, or just because they want to be able to say, I have a sponsor. There's plenty of that out there. But the big book tells us that we reach a point, and you'll find it on page 96. You might want to take a look. Do not be discouraged if your prospect does not respond at once. Search out another alcoholic and try again. Be sure to find someone desperate enough to accept with eagerness what you offer. That's the general rule. And uh, we, our time is short. And uh, we have only so much energy. And we are, we are presented uh, with, by God's will and, and through His grace with many, many people that we can help. And some of them are just not going to be willing to accept it. Now we can ask and pray, and maybe, and, and maybe if we can get them praying, maybe something will change in them. But generally speaking, um, that kind of uh, unwillingness springs from what the big book talks about in chapter 5, that they are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. And the one thing that scares them to death is they look at those steps and they see that they're going to have to face themselves. They're not willing to do that. They'll drag their feet at every occasion to avoid that. They're scared of the fourth step, they're scared of the fifth step, and they're scared of the ninth step because they know they're going to have to go make amends and their pride isn't going to let them do that either. So there's, all, there's a whole mix of stuff going on with them, but um, I've found over the years not to, not to fight with them, not to try to force them to do anything. The big book says that if he's to find God, the desire must come from within. And if it's not there, go on to the next person. That's the best advice I can give you. It is uh, common practice with uh, sponsors these days to uh, get a new person and have them read the uh, oh, first couple chapters or, you know, as your sponsor sees it, or even get real wild and have them read the first 164 pages. But that's not what the big book tells us to do. On page 95, we're coming close to the end to the, the instructions which the big book gives us concerning how to work with a new person and how we go about working with somebody who's brand new. In the second full paragraph, on a third full paragraph on page 95, we have already told them about how we drank and what it did to us and how we tried to stop. We told them about the disease, told them how we recovered. And now it says, if he is sincerely interested and wants to see you again, ask him to read this book in the interval. And that, of course, the word this means the entire book. The reason being that we need to be sure that the newcomer has the opportunity to identify himself or herself with the stories and the fact, because somewhere back there, they're going to find themselves. They're going to find that person or those people that they can identify with, which will help them immensely in breaking down their own denial. After doing that, he must decide for himself whether he wants to go on. And this, we were talking about this earlier when you asked that question. He should not be pushed or prodded by you, his wife, or his friends. If he's to find God, the desire must come from within. Then if you turn over to page 96, the center paragraph being right in the middle of the page. Suppose now you're making your second visit to a man. He has read this volume. He's read the whole book. And says he's prepared to go through with the 12 steps of the program of recovery. Then it goes on to say we start him immediately on the steps. And so it's pretty clear that the intent here was to produce a book which in toto would be within itself sufficient to help the new person break down their denial, bring them hope, 
and show them a way to go and hopefully they will want them what we have. Now they, they took the trouble to explain to us what they were doing here and why they wrote this book and we'll find that explanation in the forward to the first edition. You go to the front part of the book if you have the uh, fourth edition or both editions it's on page Roman 13 XIII forward to the first edition. This was written in 19, 1939-1940 and it was written to explain to the person picking up the original big book why they wrote it and what it was all about. Let's see what they have to say here because and this is something that, that you're you, you need to point out to your sponsees make sure they understand what they're reading here. That we of Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. First of all, you will say, well, where do the women come in? The first woman in AA, by the way, was Marty Mann, and she had come in prior to the, the publishing of the big book in its hardcover edition. Matter of fact, the literature reveals that Bill had corresponded with Marty Mann, and uh, she had asked for a copy of his uh, original manuscript which was printed up in multi-lith. Some of you have probably seen that. There are copies of it around now. In fact, uh, Clarence Snyder, the brewmeister, copies of his copy of that manuscript are, are out there and available. And so Marty asked for a copy of the Big Book manuscript the, before it was edited by the editorial committee. Bill wrote to her saying that she could have a copy for $3.50 and that then she would be entitled to a copy of the hardcover book when it was published. So Marty had come in before this forward was written and there were a couple of other women floating around out there too but Marty's the one that we can identify precisely. And so the word women is, uh, is not entirely incorrect. Most of the people, of course, in the program were men, and the big book speaks only about he, about husbands and he. But we are more than 100 men and women who have recovered. Now, the newcomer is going to wonder about that, and we need to have an answer for him. You're telling me on the one hand, he says, that this disease is uh, uh, a disease for which there is no cure, that it is an incurable, deadly progressive illness. Now what are they saying here that they have recovered? Well, you got to go on with that phrase and parse the sentence to see what they're really saying. That we have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Now, the word hopeless there is really the key, isn't it? In other words, hopelessness is, is going to disappear as they go forward with the program. And also the big book tells us when we get to chap the fifth step that when the spiritual malady is overcome, we do straighten out mentally and physically. This does not mean that the basic illness of alcoholism is not as has been cured. In fact on page eighty five it tells us that we haven't been cured. But now we gotta look at that in in, in perspective. And we do that by referring to Dr. Silkworth's opinion and where he identifies the two basic elements of the disease. And one of those basic elements is a deficiency in our bodies, a physical problem over which we have no control and which does not clear up during our lifetime. It's always there. And that is an allergy that we have to alcohol, which results in the phenomenon of craving kicking in any time we drink, which then drives us on to drink more and more. Now that does that never goes away, it's always there. But you see the beautiful part about it is that so long as we don't take a drink, that allergy, that uh, uh, that part of our physical makeup never comes into play. 
it is only triggered by alcohol. So, so long as we can stay sober, that will never have any effect upon us. It doesn't, doesn't affect us in any other way. So they're telling us that they recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And therefore, they say, that to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. Hoo-ha! See, now there we know why they wrote the book. They didn't write this for self-aggrandizement or didn't write this book in order to put forth some cockamamie theories of their own. They were, as long as we don't take a drink, that allergy, that, uh, uh, that part of our physical makeup never comes into play. It is only triggered by alcohol. So, so long as we can stay sober, that will never have any effect upon us. It doesn't, doesn't affect us in any other way. So they're telling us that they recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. And therefore, they say, that to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. Hoo-ha! See, now there we know why they wrote the book. They didn't write this for self-aggrandizement or didn't write this book in order to put forth some cockamamie theories of their own. They wrote it so that they could, on, on paper, in print, show us precisely how they recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Now the word precisely is very important there. This means, and over and over again the big book uses phrases like that. A set of precise instructions it talks about. The simple kit of spiritual tools. Carefully following directions. We get these same words over and over again throughout the book. Because that's what they intended. When we read chapter 5 and how it works, we need to listen carefully and read carefully because there's not a single weasel word in that whole three pages. Everything it says there is a categorical imperative. It's an, it's, it is an absolute. This is what we must do. And in AA, must means or else. And so when we look here, we, we start right out to begin the book understanding that what we're going to be reading is a precise history of exactly how the guys who wrote this book recovered from a hopeless state, seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. Understanding that, then we know what this book's all about. <laughs> then we can relate its various parts to each other and see how they all fit together. And everything in the book is in one way or another designed to accomplish this very purpose, showing us precisely how they recovered. Good example, the first step. Now the first step is actually a step which is contained, there's first step material in every part of the big book. All of the chapters, the doctor's opinion, the forwards, and all and each of the stories. All the book, the whole book is, has first step material in it. When you're, when you're working with a sponsee on the first step, the, the big book is the, is the uh, teaching ground. This is where they're going to learn about themselves. This is where they're going to learn what's going on with them, what's wrong with them. This is where they're going to learn that they've got this problem and to learn to admit that they have this problem and then to go even further than that and admit that they're powerless over this problem. So be going beyond denial and now going to reality. What is the present reality of that newcomer? That they have no power over this disease and what that means, and they will see this as they read the book, is that they have an incurable progressive deadly illness which means that if they do not stop drinking they will die but the catch is they can't stop drinking that's the powerlessness powerlessness means in the first step I can't stop drinking on my own that's what it means and for somebody to come up to me and say well just don't drink 
how useless can that be? Just don't breathe, just don't eat. I've got to drink because I can't help myself. That's what powerlessness means. So when we look at it from that standpoint, we see that we're, we're dealing here with a disease which is going to be described all the way through the big book. So when we look at the book, we look at this book is all first step material, everything in it. The first step is defined, of course, on page 30. Only four lines there, second paragraph. You might want to take a look at it. Very simple. When you read it, you say, well, wait a second, there's something wrong here. Something's missing here. Let's see what it says. Second paragraph, page 30. We learned that we had to fully concede to our innermost selves that we were alcoholics. This is the first step in recovery. Now it goes on with the further proviso, which is really the second part of the first step. The delusion that we're like other people or presently may be has to be smashed. So now we see that there are in fact two parts of first step. That, that, that gift that we receive of the full concession to our innermost selves that we're alcoholics, which means that we have come to accept, to understand, to accept that we're totally powerless over that first drink, <clears throat> that we have minds which are so twisted that we're filled with, with the obsession, compulsion to drink, and we have no power over that, and then sooner or later we're going to hit a place where, where we will not be able to stop, and when we start drinking, then of course the, the obsession is there, but so is the allergy, and uh, then we can't stop. Once we start, we can't stop, and that's what's going to kill us. The other part of that first step is that we have to be willing to accept and then and, and to know and to accept the fact that we can never safely drink alcohol again the rest of our lives. See what happens here is, and, and you're going to find this all the way through, throughout all your groups, all your meetings, there are people who though they have admitted they're powerless over alcohol or that they're an alcoholic and they say it every time in a meeting and so on, they never really came to believe and accept as a truth that they could never safely drink again, that the plug is in the jug, that this is it, no more booze ever. Because when, when they carry that reservation into the rest of the steps, they fail. Because the steps really have no meaning for the person who is waiting for that time somewhere down the road when they can pick up the next drink and do it with impunity. Because it's the great obsession of every alcoholic that someday somehow he's going to be able to drink and enjoy his liquor just like other people. That's his great obsession. And until that's gone, the first step cannot be worked. You notice that there's something missing here. This whole business of, uh, just a second, David, this whole business of, uh, of unmanageability. And the treatment centers love to have you write out answers to 455 questions about unmanageable life as if that proves that you're an alcoholic. Well, that's total nonsense. Most people's lives are unmanageable by them. God runs this world, we don't. Unmanageability is, is uh, something which is just a fact for us. Our, our alcoholism and our drinking has made our lives probably a lot more unmanageable than they would be otherwise. But it's not a proof of a proof of alcoholism. The first step is the concession, which is a gift, by the way, great gift, that we're an alcoholic, it's deep down inside, and then accepting that we're going to have to content ourselves with a lifetime of absence and sobriety. Yes, David. Actually, Tom had a question. <laughs> <laughs> My name's Tom. I'm not yes, Tom. Yeah. Uh, backing up to where we're talking about the physical allergy. Yes. I like to believe everything in the big book, and, and I, whenever I read the big book, I understand what I'm reading. Uh huh. That's one concept that I've always had problems with: the physical allergy. Uh, I I think that my 
like a physical allergy that wants alcohol as part of my body, I'm going to crave it. I keep thinking to myself, you know, I don't believe that. I think I've just got a, a mental obsession and a compulsion, and it has nothing to do with a physical allergy. Uh, for instance, there's a lot of things I can put into my body that's going to create a huge craving. And, and, and I, when I try to analyze it, maybe I analyze it too much, I, I can't stop believing that it's just a mental obsession in my head. You know, not that I would mind having a physical uh, a physical allergy to it, but I just think that it's a, a mental obsession that I know if I put alcohol into my body, my, my mental state won't let me stop drinking. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I suppose it doesn't make any difference, does it? It doesn't, but I mean, I, I just... Because uh, a lot of people use this, this allergy thing as, a, as a, an excuse, and we don't want that to happen. But uh, I would refer you to uh, page Roman 28, XXVIII. Now, the guy who wrote this was the director of the alcohol and drug rehab hospital and it had 25 years of experience working with thousands of alcoholics and addicts prior to the time he wrote this and this is his opinion that's why in the big book it is labeled as an opinion first paragraph we believe and so suggested a few years ago that the action of alcoholic on these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy that the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. No. What? That's not the right page. Well, uh, do you have, oh sure, do you have third edition? Go to, uh, go to 26 then, XXVI. First full paragraph. Everybody got it. It's either, it's either 26 or 28, depending on which book you have. XXVIII or XXVI. Third edition is 26. Everybody got it? Let's do this again because this is, this is basic. This is, this is such basic material for everything in our program. We believe, and we sug and so suggested a few years ago, that the action of alcohol in these chronic alcoholics is a manifestation of an allergy. That the phenomenon of craving is limited to this class and never occurs in the average temperate drinker. These allergic types can never safely use alcohol in any form at all. And once having formed a habit and found they cannot break it, once having lost their self-confidence, their reliance upon things human, their problems pile up on them and become astonishingly difficult to solve. Now, I'm not here to plead the case of Dr. Silkworth, of course, but I, I, I have to believe that this guy had such a depth of experience and knowledge that his, that his opinion, which is what this is, carries a lot of weight. Now, there's another thing that would lead me to believe that. In 1947, the American Medical Association agreed with him said this is a this is a disease and uh, a big part of that disease concept had to do with this the, with this perceived allergy whether whether we whether you want to call it the same thing as uh, strawberry rash or malaleuca sneezing I don't know but the, but the, the the medical profession has identified uh, a reaction that alcoholics have to alcohol which is not normal and, and uh, experience would lead you to believe that they're, because we get lots of them in here, people are hard drinkers. And they get in trouble, they get a DUI or two and uh, they get a nudge from the judge and they end up in here. And uh, they like it. They like being here. They like the fellowship, they like the love, they like the attention, and they stay. Those people can stay sober given sufficient reason to do so. They don't really need the steps or the big book. Many of them, of course, do work the steps and become very extremely valuable members of AA. But the point is that where we have a chronic alcoholic, we've got somebody who has a dual problem. The obsession compulsion is there, 
And when that kicks in, and the strange mental blank spots that we run into, where we just start drinking, maybe it doesn't take any trigger. Triggers are just a product of somebody's imagination. We don't need triggers. We drink because our mind tells us to drink, whether, no matter what our circumstances are. But taking that first drink does something to us which makes it then impossible for us to stop. Maybe not the first time. After, on the first day of a slip, we might have enough uh, willpower to, to hold it off for a day. But something has happened to us, and the next day we want more, and then we want pretty soon. If you've been on, if you've been on binges like I have, you know that you reach a certain point where you just can't stop. Can't. I mean, you can't stop. And you're going to keep going until you drop. And so that's, I, I think, regardless of whether we, and the reason I, I made the comment, does, does it really matter? Because we can look at the external evidence and we can see what in fact happens to us. And whether you want to call an allergy or not doesn't seem to be all that relevant. Because I think Dr. Silkworth was analogizing there anyway. And the reason he had to analogize is because he saw that this effect was not universally true of all humans, only of a certain class of humans. Now whether it's something which builds up over time in certain people because they drink heavily and some get it and some don't, I don't know. But, but if we go back to the basic fact that we can never safely drink alcohol again the rest of our lives, that seems to be totally fundamental to getting the rest of the program. Because I know you've experienced people who have that reservation and they don't make it because the, because the, the steps are not that important to them. The steps are important as a showcase for the fact that they're in recovery, but in the back of their minds are saying somewhere down the line, I'm going to be able to, to drink and enjoy my drinking and get back out there and, and, and control my drinking. This is what this is their, their obsession. Does that all make sense? Sure. Okay, well, thanks for the question. That's a darn good question. Anybody else have a comment on what we've just been talking about? Yes? That's a, a real interesting part of the doctor's opinion. I, I just, you know, the doctor's opinion to me has made a lot of difference because that really taught me and made me understand that this alcoholism that I have is a disease. Yeah. And you know, quite frankly, when it talks about this allergy, it really doesn't talk about an allergy to the body. It just says allergy. And it says, you know, that the phenomena of craving is limited to this class. So the allergy, you know, it seems to me is talking about it brings on this phenomena of craving. And I know for me, when, you know, I took that one drink, and you mentioned that, I, I remember, because I tried to stop on my own, and I said, you know, I can stop at the Bandit Lounge and have one drink. You know, there was a couple times that I did. But then, you know, that old self-confidence came back. And I said, you know, I did fine. I just had one drink. I won't stop in and have another. But that second time, it wasn't one. That phenomenon of craving was there. Because I wanted where it was in the mind or the body. It didn't make any difference. It was there. And I got drunk, needless to say. So I like that, you know, it, it really doesn't say it's an allergy to the body, it's just an allergy. Mm -hmm. So if it makes no difference, really, maybe it's in my body, maybe it's not yours, maybe it's in his mind, maybe it's in my mind, not the other guy's. But what the main point is, is that, you know, that craving occurs when we take that first drink. Yeah, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, you notice the language, though, Glenn, is very carefully put forth there. What does he say? that it is the manifestation of an allergy, which really means the evidence of the existence of an allergy. And you're dead right. He isn't saying it is an allergy. He's saying that it's a manifestation of an allergy. And so it, it's almost like he's drawing an analogy here rather than trying to evidence a, 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 a medical opinion that this is a true allergy. Now, when the AMA accepted this, as a disease, they adopted basically his language. And when you, if you, if you study the medical text on it now, you'll see that 
nobody is willing to jump right up and say alcoholics as a class are allergic to alcohol in the sense that some people are allergic uh, to bee stings or malaleuca dust or any of that stuff because uh, it, it, you, know, you can't do a patch test on it, you know. I mean, you, it would be simple to find out if people are, are, uh, are uh, alcoholics, make them come in and have an allergist do a patch test on their arm and if it turns red and, and all welty, then, they're, then they got an allergy. But that doesn't, that's not the way it works. So I think that Dr. Shook was, was trying to define in the in, in language that we can understand the, um, the, the the symptomology that's that's going on here. That this is an indication that there's something which we could we could analogize to or even call an allergy, although we can't define it in, in exact medical or scientific terms. So your 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 thinking is right on, and so is Tom's. But I think um, so long as we accept, Tom, uh, that it is a uh, uh, peculiarity which exists with alcoholics, it doesn't really matter what we call it, because the bottom line, Glenn, is that we can't safely drink alcohol. And, and that, to me, that's the important thing here, because, see, that's so critical to first step understanding, that uh, the plug's in the jug can never safely drink alcohol again. Now, be, be, and because that's true, then it follows that because we have no power to stop drinking, that we're gonna have to find a power greater than ourselves to solve our problem. Because if it were not true that we, if it were not true that we could never safely drink alcohol again, then we could all run around with the hope that this would clear up after a while. And maybe somebody would discover a pill that would take care of it. And, all those pills and shots and stuff they've tried over the years since I've been around have been total failures. I don't know if anybody in here has ever, ever tried antabuse, but a real alcoholic drink right through antabuse and take the consequences. And um, people like the, the University of Miami Hospital and the, and the RAND Institute and uh, these big think tanks and medical centers all over, every t two years or so somebody comes out saying we, we've got the stuff now to make a normal drinker out of an alcoholic and make a social drinker out of it. And it gets big headlines and then about three years later there's a little column down on page 18 the bottom of the page that says, oops, it didn't work. In the meantime a whole bunch of people tried it and a lot of them probably died because of it. The truth of the matter is no, no, nobody's ever found a, a solution except these guys. But they found a solution that never fails. Why in the hell would we want to do anything else? Millions of alcoholics have recovered before us. Doesn't that teach us something? Why would we go anywhere else? Just pick this book up, follow their path, and recover. It's so damn simple. And as a sponsor, I consider it, that's my responsibility to make sure that my sponsors understand that. This is an open meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. We're glad you're here, especially the newcomer. Uh, in keeping with our singleness of purpose and our third tradition, which states that the only requirement for membership is a desire to stop drinking, we ask that all who participate confine their discussion to their problems with alcohol. As per group conscience, please silence all beepers and cell phones. And uh, if you feel a need for side conversation, please take it outside. Before we go any further, are there, is there anyone at their very first AA meeting? It's not to embarrass you, but just to get to know you. Is there anyone new to this meeting that would like to introduce themselves with their first name so we get to know you? Yes? Hi, my name is Terry and I'm an alcoholic. Welcome. Welcome, Welcome Terry. Welcome. Terry. I'm Dave. I'm an alcoholic. I'm this week. Welcome, Dave. Yeah. Welcome, Dave. I'm a bird. I'm an alcoholic. Okay. Welcome. Hi, Welcome. Welcome. Okay. Very good. Okay. Well, uh, this is a sponsorship workshop and... Uh, Jim will be conducting that out of the uh, big book and uh, just to remind us that uh, sometime you may have a question or you want to clarify or bring something up, just raise your hand. All right, so let's give it, turn it over to Jim. Thank you, David. My name is Jim. I'm an alcoholic. Hey, Hi, I'm glad to be here. Wish everybody a happy 4th of July, and 
We're small but mighty tonight. We're going to have some fun. We're going to take a good look at some pretty interesting stuff in the big book. I want to welcome our friends from Baltimore. It's wonderful to have you here. And uh, Terry, who's our friend, who's uh, here tonight for the first time. My sobriety date is December 20th, 1964. I've been sober through the grace of God since that time. And uh, I'm very, very grateful person for that. For those of you who haven't been with us before, we call this a sponsorship workshop. And we've been doing this in various places uh, for about 15 years now. Uh, presently, there are three sponsorship workshops going contemporaneously with each other, one here and one at the 101 Club on, on Saturday morning, uh, Saturday afternoon at 1.30, and one in Hallandale on Wednesday nights at 7. And the whole purpose of these workshops is for us to uh, improve our skills in uh, carrying the message, and, uh, to improve our skills in teaching the uh, uh, 12 steps and the big book and the traditions to our sponsees and also for people who are relatively new the material we cover is great help in working your own program and, and for those of us been around for a while it is a uh, constant reminder of the uh, principles that we follow and the magnificence of this program that we're so blessed to have. I wanted to make a little comment about uh, what Terry read, the Bill's original manuscript. This is a, this is a work of art, and of course it's, it's, it's out there floating around. Originally that manuscript was selling for $3.50. Bill had uh, reproduced it on Multilith, and uh, we know what they were charging for it because they're, they're in the archives there's a letter that he wrote to uh, to uh, Marty Mann, the uh, first, first woman in AA, and she'd asked for a copy of his manuscript, and he wrote back and said, yeah, I'll send you one, it costs you three fifty. And then when the book is published in hardcover, you get to have a free book. When that manuscript was uh, t taken to the uh, editorial committee, a lot of this stuff we know fairly well because uh, Clarence Snyder who recently died. Clarence was the brewmeister, one of the stories in the original book, and carried forward through the third edition. And Clarence uh, was one of the uh, editorial guys. He claimed there were 25 or 26 of them that actually worked on on the manuscript and, and uh, finally agreed on the, on the uh, book as it was published uh, in hardcover. And uh, it was interesting to talk to Clarence because there was so much going on at that time. You know, it's just a bloody miracle that this thing ever survived back there in those days. These guys were, they were really at each other's throats a lot of the time. And my namesake, Jim B., was very adamant about much of what he didn't like, and he was, uh, he was quite vociferous about it. He, in fact, he had a lot of influence in some of the wording that ended up in, in the hardcover. But I guess the really interesting thing about it is that if we look at the forward to the first edition, which was written toward the end, uh, just before publication, it wasn't it wasn't in the original manuscript. And there they announced the real purpose of the big book as they'd come to know it, which was that uh, to show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this volume. Now, you could hear from what Terry was reading that when Bill originally wrote it, he wrote it as an instruction manual to a large extent, although he did, he, he did include a lot of stuff that we, we did, we meaning the original people, the original 100. But a lot of it was written in the uh, uh, second person singular. You got to do this and you got to do that. And when the uh, editorial board got hold of this, they said, no, 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 we don't want to do it that way. We want this to, to read as a history, not as some kind of uh, a philosophy that we've dreamed up or uh, some bunch of crackpot schemes that we think ought to work for other people. We want this to be 
truly a history. In other words, we want it to recite what we have done, and then we want to urge other alcoholics to follow our footsteps, because we've come to believe over these three and something years that if, if anybody, any alcoholic who, uh, who follows what we've done will also recover from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. You remember Dr. Bob and his story, which is printed in the first edition, his first story in the back of the book, he makes a flat statement that it never fails. But of course he said you got to go about it with one half the zeal you used to go about getting your next drink. And so if you, if you look at the original manuscript and then you look at the hardcover, first edition, first, uh, the first printing of the first edition, you find that the changes, many, many of the changes had to do with removing the second person singular, you got to do this, you got to do that, and substituting it with we did this and we did that. And as a result of that, everybody, there are a lot of people running around here these days who insist this is a we program. Well, it may, it, in, some, in some respects, I'm sure they're right. It doesn't mean they worked the steps together. It doesn't mean they sat down and, and did their, their four steps en masse and then uh, all got together, did a fifth step and it, with one, with, at one time and all that. That isn't what happened. As a matter of fact, the big book is quite clear that this is a one-on-one -on -one program, one alcoholic working with another. It started out that way with Roland Hazard working with Abby and then Abby working with Bill and Bill working with Dr. Bob and Bill and Bob working with Bill D and on and on and on and on. And the big book is clear about it that it says both you and the new man must walk day by day in the path of spiritual progress. It's a one-on-one -on -one program. That's why sponsorship becomes such a vital issue. The biggest problem in AA today is lack of good sponsorship. There's so much baloney out there now, and it's perpetuated, handed down from one generation to the next, and just it seems to get baloneyer and baloneyer as it goes. So one of the things we do in this workshop, we get that back to the big book, and we parse the book, and we read it, we look at what it says word for word, and we try to discern how all the steps fit together and how the big book fits together and we love to we want to see the beauty of it and the inspirations which it contains so that we can carry this to the newcomer and give them well we're kind of like we're kind of like the Oxfordians you know they they wanted to practice first century Christianity but we want to practice first uh, first 10 years AA around here at least I do and I'm hoping that those of you who may have some doubt about that, once we've completed these 35 weeks or whatever it takes us to do this, we'll be convinced that the answers are in the big book and that they are inspired and that they do work and that the millions of recoveries since this book was published prove that they work. And so what's wrong with us if we don't understand that? And that's what we are going to learn to carry. That's the message we're going to carry. Now, we were talking last week in, uh, about the forward of the first edition. We, we had uh, we'd examined sponsorship a little bit and what it is, what it is not. And now the next phase of our workshop is going to be a, a very thoroughgoing look at the big book so that we will know where everything is, how it all ties together, <coughs> how... Uh, how it was written, what it means. We get to we get to sample the beauty of it. We get to see that the big book is entirely consistent internally. As a matter of fact, it's the only writing I've ever seen, which I can say that about without without any uh, reservations at all. It's completely consistent. And what it tells you in Bill's story, it tells you again in chapter 11. Now, of course, some of the stories in the back may get a little off base, but the bulk of the big book, the, the first 164 pages, the doctor's opinion, and the forwards are all extremely consistent, and they follow a certain pathway, and it, it's so bloody simple, sometimes we miss the simplicity of it. And it goes something like this. That we're alcoholics. Alcoholism is a deadly, incurable, progressive illness. If we don't stop drinking, we will die. 
but we can't stop drinking. Therefore, we are powerless over alcohol, but there is a solution. The solution is to make a surrender to a power greater than ourselves, surrender to that power, learn to do that power's will, learn to follow a few simple directions, learn to live a life based upon principles rather than self-will. Find out what didn't work, stop doing that, start doing what will work, and your whole life will change. And the big book makes it clear that the moment that we have drawn close to God and then continue to do his work well and continue to stay close to him, he'll give us everything we need. And Terry just got through reading those three pertinent ideas. The third one is the, is the promise that God can and will remove from us the obsession compulsion to drink alcohol if we seek him. And then it becomes quite clear the way we see God around here is we open up the big book, find the directions to work the steps and work the steps. It is in the working the steps that we seek God and the promise is true. And we will have a spiritual awakening and we, we will be restored to sanity and we will be reborn in our thinking and we will have uh, become very close to God, we'll become God conscious we'll enter the world of spirit, we'll develop a high degree of humility and gratitude and we will make sure that we have fit ourselves to be a maximum service to God and the people about us and then we will follow the dictates of a higher power for the rest of our lives. Now, there's nothing complicated about that. As Bill said in his story, simple but not easy, a price had to be paid. And it meant the destruction of our ego and our pride. And it told us this, that we're going to have to turn in all things to the Father of Light. And the big book is entirely consistent all the way through. It continues to follow this theme precisely. Turn in all things to the Father of Light who presides over us all. And it gives the lie to so much of what passes now for recovery around here, which is all based on human solution stuff. If I'm going to tell somebody, for example, you can't have a relationship, an affair, a sex liaison with anybody for a year, and then we turn around and we look at the big book, and the big book says, our sex powers are God-given and therefore good. Just don't use them lightly or selfishly or don't hate them. And if you have a problem, in your morning meditation, you ask God what you should do about each specific problem, and the right answer will come if you want it. That's a solution, not something that human solution stuff is made up in treatment centers or someplace. And so when we look at the book and we read it and we're careful and we'll do that in this, in this workshop, we get to see that the book is always consistent and that the rules and, and the spiritual principles that we learn that, 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 can, that teach us how to conduct our lives never vary. They're always the same and they apply to every human being and they, not, well, not just alcoholics, we don't own these things. They're, their principles have been around forever. The big difference is that in, in the 12 steps, these same ancient spiritual principles are restated as steps of action. Which means if we take the action, if we do the work, we incorporate the principles into our lives. They become the way we live our lives. That's why the big book can say the, the spiritual life is not a theory. We have to live it. And the 12 steps, steps is practice these principles in all your affairs. So now when we, when we read the big book from the, in the light of it being a history, that is a recitation of the things which the first pioneers in this fellowship did to achieve sobriety and freedom and victory over alcohol and, and over the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body which they came in with, then we see what they're saying to us. Here's what we did, it worked for us, and we sincerely believe that if you do what we did, it will work for you as well. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? And when we understand that, we can throw out all this malarkey, this stuff that tries to take the big book and tear it apart and all that stuff and, and because it, it doesn't conform to some present idea of psychology or psychiatry or religion or 
treatment center gobbledygook. The other thing we have to watch out for in this, in this, in this workshop, we do not use the 12 and 12, and I'll tell you why. Aside from the fact that Bill wrote that thing when he was sick to death and was suicidal and depressed and had been dabbling around with LSD, aside from the fact that his uh, so-called sponsor, Father Ed Dowling, was extremely responsible for so much of what he wrote, and if you read uh, the soul of sponsorship, their letters back and forth, you'll find out just exactly how much influence Father Dowling uh, exercised in, in what came out in the 12 and 12, including, for example, the seven deadly sins. We don't deal with sin around here. That's not our bag. That's the church's bag, not our bag. We don't make those kinds of judgments. But the 12 and 12, unfortunately, has a lot of good sort of philosophy in it. There's some pretty nice things in there that it says about God and about and about spirituality and how we ought to conduct ourselves. The problem is, though it purports to be a, a, a book dealing with 12 steps, nowhere in that book does it ever tell you how to work them. It just talks about them. And so we want directions because we want to teach our sponsees how to work the steps and for that we must go to the big book. Now in the forward of the first edition we started out, and this is by the way is on page Roman 13, XIII, right in the beginning of the book. Last week we, we took a look at the first couple of paragraphs to, and remember that we have alcohol, right at the beginning, we have Alcoholics Anonymous are more than 100 men and women who have recovered from a seemingly hopeless state of mind and body. The word recovered there is an estimate to many people. They, they want to dispute that because they say that's inconsistent with page 85 where it tells us that we're not cured of alcoholism. No, it's not. Because what they're saying is that the seemingly hopeless state of mind and body that they walked in with, that insanity, and they were goopy as hell and so were we. But the insanity has been removed. They've been restored to sanity. And the compulsion and obsession to drink alcohol has been removed. And they are no longer powerless over alcohol so long as they stay spiritually fit. The point is that they have had victory over alcohol, even though they could have no victory over that strange quirk in their, in their bodies and their minds which reacts to alcohol as as if it were a, a substance uh, causing a, uh, what, what, what amounts to an allergy, as Dr. Silkworth described it. Only alcoholics have that, and we, we're never cured of that. But it's pretty obvious that if we don't drink alcohol, the allergy is never triggered, is it? And if we are, and, and, and we've decided we don't want to drink anymore, but we, we know we can't stop on our own, so what do we got? We have to get in God's pocket to stay there. But when we do that, the obsession compulsion is removed. The problem is solved and it never comes back. So for the rest of our lives, though we are still an alcoholic, we don't have the symptoms. They're not there. The disease is an effect in remission. And that's what that means, recovery. To show other alcoholics precisely how we have recovered is the main purpose of this book. And that's the keynote, isn't it? When we, when we read that and understand what they're telling us, then we know from here on what we're looking at is a recitation of the adventure through recovery of the first 100. And we look at it from that standpoint, it all begins to make sense. And we're saying then, okay, let's suppose that it was 19 and ought 40 right now, and this thing had just been published. And we were very doubting Thomases, and we picked that book up, and we read it, and we said, well, who are these guys? Now, where do they get off saying this? Well, now, sure, this fellow Silkworth, this doctor, says that, in his opinion, we can believe everything they say about themselves. He wrote that. It's in the front of the book. But uh, this is pretty interesting, but where's the proof? I mean, it would be very easy at that point. But now in 2003, with millions of recoveries, 
directly the result of what's in this book. How can we say that anymore? How can we say that from the 100 to the many millions today, from the three groups to a hundred thousand groups, from one society using 12 steps to 50 or more. How can we say anymore that there's, we can disregard these things? And people are doing it all the time. They don't like it. They don't want this. It does not comport with with the human solutions. It does not comport with New Age AA, which is a laissez-faire type of stuff. Feel good. Got to feel good all the time. Make them feel good. Don't do anything to hurt their little psyches. And that's too bad, because there's so many people being pushed in front of buses right now, it make, makes me sick. They don't have to be. There isn't anybody who walks in that door who cannot recover. Except those rare few that, that are psychologically incapable of being honest with themselves. So therefore, as we're going to go through this book together, we're going to be studying it in that light. That it's telling us what they did and saying, if you do what we did, it'll work. And hopefully, we've had enough experience and history behind this thing. Now we can say, yeah, 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 that's right. We know that's true. So now let's find out what they did. And let's find out how it applies to us. And let's find out how we help others to apply it to their lives. The third full paragraph on page Roman 13. This is kind of an interesting little paragraph. When writing or speaking publicly about alcoholism, we urge each of our fellowship to omit his personal name, designate himself instead as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, this is the closest thing we have in any part of our literature that it directs us as to how we announce ourselves. And the custom of using only first names in our, in our private meetings with each other seems to be of questionable value. Bill remarked on it many times. His remark usually settled around this. If nobody in, in, in your group tells their last names, how will you know who they are? I can tell you a hundred times I've known that somebody was in the hospital. I call the hospital and ask them how they're doing, and I don't know their last name. Oh, you know that uh, that blonde-headed woman who came in last night at uh, what's the alcoholic uh, poisoning? Oh, that one, yeah. <laughs> and yet, the traditions do not require of us that we do that at all, except when 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 speaking or appearing publicly. And the reason for that is that the Twelfth Tradition is quite clear that we are to practice a high degree of humility and we are to be willing to sacrifice our natural need for acclaim and notoriety by using only our first name in public. And it is that humility and it is that self-sacrifice which is the key to the 12th step, a 12th tradition. It had nothing to do with the fear of discovery. The big book and the traditions do not pander to fear in any way. We've made that up ourselves. We've also come up with these cockamamie closed meetings, which is so strange because the big book is full of the, of the information which leads us to believe that alcoholism is a family disease and yet we close the families out of our meetings and say, you can't come here. I know you're only eight years old, but you might run down to your grammar school class and rat a bunch of us out. And we can't have that. And so we close our meetings and we close our minds. Whereas the whole history of AA shows us that this is a family disease and that in the first few years, if it had not been for the fact that the families were meeting together and the wives were willing to, to uh, work the 12 steps themselves and to practice the principles and try hard to understand the spiritual way of life, they probably wouldn't have survived. Well, we've closed that all down. But here, this is interesting from another standpoint because we have so many uh, um, 
pandas around now. It's what uh, some of my friends, contemporaries in this program call us. Call, uh, not me, but call anybody who's a, 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 an addict and an alcoholic, they call them andas. And one guy I know that after every meeting will sit there and say, well, there are only four andas here today. That's a pretty good meeting. And yet when we read the big book, it talks directly about the fact that these that, that, that they were using they were using drugs. I mean it's all so silly, but anyway, the idea then that some people have that, that they don't know whether they want to introduce themselves as an alcoholic. Well the big book doesn't say that, does it? It says all you have to do is announce yourself as a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. And of course the truth of it is that the traditions make it clear that nobody can challenge that. Remember when you say you are. Nobody can challenge whether you have a desire to stop drinking or not. We don't have any kangaroo courts. We don't have an admissions committee. Remember the Oxford group did. They'd sit you down in a circle and they'd all pass judgment on you. And some of the original groups used to have very high admission requirements. In fact, New York group used to demand to see your financial statement. They weren't going to have any bums off the street. They weren't going to mess with them. But that's all passed. They found out in the early days that if you took the admission requirements, the membership requirements of all the groups and lumped them together as one, and most of the people who were in the original 100 would never have been able to qualify as a member, which pulled them up short. You know, they had to figure about them. There's something wrong here. What's the matter with us anyway? And so, if you got somebody who is hesitant about announcing that my name is Jim and I'm an alcoholic, then fine, that's no problem. My name is Jim and I'm a member of AA. And that's is all you need to say. Give me authority, but that's right here, isn't it? Very earnestly we ask the press also to observe this request, for otherwise we shall be greatly handicapped. Now, that wasn't very difficult. As a matter of fact, part of the reason that the that the fellowship survived is that the press was very, very, very gentle with us and very supportive. And if, if some eager beaver member wanted his full name published and wanted to make some publicity for himself, the people at the press would remind him, hey, you're not supposed to do that. You know, what's your first name? What's your last initial? The other thing, it was because they loved the sport, you know, the press was so used to and so cynical about human nature and how everybody wants to feather their own nest and wants to get publicity and, and, and wants to uh, further their own causes. We don't. Everybody out there is looking for an edge. We aren't. Everybody out there wants something, money, power, prestige. We don't. And they came to understand that that was true. This is actually the way we are. We are not out to aggrandize ourselves in any way or to do anything which will pour money into our meager purse. And so they, they've come to admire us. We're a breath of fresh air, and we've stayed that way, you know. And the same way with government and the, and the professions, they've had to grudgingly admit these people are truly eleemosynary. They are charitable. They are doing this without expectation of any return at all. And we don't know how in the world they can manage to keep themselves together. It's, it's, a, it's the loosest form of anarchy we've ever seen. You've got no organization, no nothing. Nobody's telling what to do and nobody has any rules and nobody can enforce them even if they did. I tried to form a branch of the A police at one time, and I, New York turned me down and said, you can't have such a thing. I thought, oh boy, if I could just have some A police, we could really swell the coffers of this place. You'd, you know, we'd watch everybody when the hat came around, you better put money in there or else. You know, if you don't show up at a meeting, we'll come knocking on your door. Now that's, I'm just joking, I wouldn't, I would often thought it was not a bad idea, but I didn't carry it that far. <laughs> We are not an organization in the conventional sense, amen to that, of the word. There are no fees or dues whatsoever. Aha, uh -huh. we're getting right into traditions now, aren't we? Look at here, 
The traditions start all the way back in the port of the first edition, 1939. And it was not until 1946 that Bill got around to writing what was in the, the, uh, the traditions, the so-called long form. But they really started back here. There are no fees or dues, whatever. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. And I'd love to get Bill aside and say, Bill, what the hell do you mean by honest desire? Would a dishonest desire work? I mean, what, what is a dishonest desire? It's either desire, isn't it, Bill? Well, of course, what happened when they wrote the tradition, that honest was left out, wasn't it? Because, because honestly, it shouldn't, that word shouldn't have been in there in the first place. We're not allied with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. And so you see the, the genesis of four or five of the traditions right here in the very beginning. And it's interesting to notice that these guys already had, uh, uh, had learned from the past because they'd been studying the Washingtonians and they knew what happened to that bunch back there in 1840. We saw then that four, five or six of the what became the traditions uh, were already recognized at the time the big book was written. And that's because the, uh, by 1939, by, excuse me, 1939, some of the guys had gotten uh, uh, involved in looking back into history. And there was a group in the 1800s, beginning about 1840, called the Washingtonian Society. And there was, uh, at one time they'd made a big splash, so there was quite a bit written about them. As a matter of fact, if you go on the internet, you can, and go under Washingtonians, you'll find their history is still out there, and you can run off a copy of it. And the Washingtonians uh, <coughs> originated with six guys sitting around getting drunk. And they, one of them had this bright idea, why don't we get sober? Say, so, yeah, yeah, let's all get sober, you know, that kind of stuff. So, but then they decided to take it seriously. And um, they formed this society called the Washingtonian Society. I don't know where the word came from, but they figured out that the way to uh, grow very quickly was through the churches and through the uh, prohibition or the temperance movement. Now, the temperance movement was very, very big in those days. As a matter of fact, uh, it was uh, an incipient uh, political party as well as being a uh, religious movement or centered by uh, actually in the churches. Now, the temperance people were not uh, advocating uh, complete abstinence. They were trying to get people to slow down or to have a drink now and then, but to recognize the dangers of alcohol and through religious convictions and prayer and willpower to control their drinking. Now, a lot of people, of course, took the, the uh, temperance pledge uh, with the idea that they have complete abstinence, but that was not that was not necessary in order to be accepted as a member or as a part of the temperance movement. And so, but the Washingtonians, of course, were preaching uh, complete abstinence. In any event, the, the churches around the East um, welcomed these Washingtonians into their churches and let them get up there and, and preach uh, complete abstinence. And in fact, they, after they got through with their uh, monologue, they would ask people to come forward and sign a pledge of abstinence and, uh, and join the Washingtonian society. And so they grew very, very rapidly. And within a short time, they are credited with having over 100,000 members. Now, the six guys who started it, of course, uh, uh, they were big shots, and they, they were getting uh, 
a lot of publicity and they were being asked to speak from every Chautauqua stump and from all the church pulpits and they were being treated uh, as uh, sort of semi-royalty kind of like the television preachers today and if you're if you're on that circuit you're working